said what community land trust should be about is a preferential option for the poor. Other people harken back to, the, to Gandhi's idea of trusteeship, that people deserve enough of the land, the water, the air, the community's resources to have a livelihood, but beyond that, the poor have the first claim on everything else, particularly the land. In the United States, community land trust, we take trust not from the idea of legal trust. We take it from the Gandhian idea of trusteeship. The second thing, the urban community land trust in particular, introduced to this model is the idea that you can't just put people into houses, put mom and pop stores into new enterprises, and say good luck that if you're going to continue to own the land, you must be a steward of the improvements that you built on the land, the improvements that you sold off. You don't just cut the ribbon and say goodbye. So when people get in trouble down the road, community land trusts in the United States see it as their responsibility to step back in and to protect not just the land that the land trust owns, but the assets that we've helped low-income people to acquire. And then finally, the urban CLTs taught us that if you want to preserve affordability over time, if you want to preserve the public's investment in the housing and in the land, it's not enough just to take the cost of the housing out of the deal, the cost of the land out of the deal. You also have to put a durable control on the resale price of the buildings. We build into our ground lease a preemptive option pricing formula that gives the nonprofit organization the first right to repurchase any homes, any businesses, any structures down the road when their owners decide to resell. And we buy them back at a price that's designed to give the current owner, the seller, a fair return on their investment, but to preserve affordability for the next generation. And that was an element that was really brought in to the model, grafted up the model by the urban community land trust. The other thing I think the urban trust reminded the CLT movement of is that it's never enough to become a skilled developer. Unless you continue to be a community organizer, then you're going to lose the integrity of the model and the accountability for the community. So the other thing that was grafted on here operationally is Wear two hats. You have to be a developer, you have to be a community organizer at one and the same time. Even in Burlington, Vermont, the People's Republic of Burlington, we discovered that every you know, seven or eight years, uh, we have to go back out and act like community organizers. We have to mobilize, particularly when they, there's a change in government and they try to defund us. So we have to go back in the streets and we have to protest to get our money in order to continue to do the, uh, uh, the work that we're trying to, to do. And we want to do it. Of course, in the United States, every time we come up with a new innovation, graph on a new element, we can write another book. Um, 1982, we kind of revisited the Community Land Trust book that was written in 72, and really laid out all of these elements of the model. And at that point, from 1982 on, we really had all of these elements together that we think of in the United States as the classic community land trust. And you can see the growth line. You know, it's like by 1982, we had all the pieces in place. And it jumped over into the urban area. We now had not just community ownership of the land, an interesting organizational structure, but we had these operational elements permanent affordability, permanent responsibility, preferential option for the poor, and constant revisiting of your base, constant community organizing. And I think that is what has helped the Community Land Trust line to go up. I'm going to stop here for and um, have a conversation, um, but also say that what we do best as Community Land Trust is what we call stewardship. Anybody can develop. You know, for-profit developers, non-profit developers, Habitat for Humanity, housing associations, 
What we do particularly well is what happens after you sell off the buildings. We're in the deal forever. And we stand behind the deal to protect affordability, to protect the public investment, to protect the condition of the housing, and to intervene in cases of foreclosure. Our foreclosure rates in our sector are minuscule. They are eight times lower than what we're finding in the market sector for similar owner-occupied housing. And we have the data today to prove that. We're going to open it up for some questions and conversation. Before we do, Dad, would you like to, to add anything, particularly on this element, with stewardship, because your organization does stewardship as well as any CLT that I know. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for welcoming us today. And I have to say that um, the most important thing about a community land trust model is the word trust, and in more ways than one. What really makes it successful is a relationship and the trust that we develop with our homeowners. When we go out to the community and we recognize that families need a place to raise their little ones and that we are talking not just about the bricks and the mortar and the structure, we're really talking about the quality of life. We're really talking about giving a child an opportunity to have a home that they know they're going to be in for more than just a month or two or a year. The security of home ownership changes lives. But not everyone knows what is going to happen in, 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 in the duration of their home ownership. Things come up. Uh, it, it, your job may change. You may need help with your budget. You may have home repairs come up. So before we sell a house, we do homeowner education. And it's not like this in a big room. Because this is, you are a community. And we have our first community meeting was 200 people to just talk about the fact that we were having a land trust and that we know <coughs> the line out the door. But when the families were selected, there was a one-on-one -on -one meeting with myself and the homeowner for an hour and a half. And we really talked about why homeownership and what this responsibility meant. And one of the key things that I told every single one of our homeowners was the following. If anything is going to change, or you think something in your life is going to change, good or bad, call me. And I said this, you know, five years ago, three years ago, every time we have a new subdivision, and in the last three years, you know, you know since this terrible economy has taken over, I truly cannot believe how many times my phone has run. Now, so I'm in this good news, we have lots of babies being born and people getting married and I've gone to weddings and so on. But a lot of it has been, oh my gosh, my husband's going to get laid off. Oh my gosh, my hours are going to get cut. Um, I want to rebuy. I don't know what to do. I'm getting these calls. What does this mean? Am I, is my house underwater? What is going on with the news? And what does that mean for me? And we are there to answer the phone. And that is key to success because if something is going to happen in someone's life and they're not sure and they go into a panic state, then the next time that they are going to react to this in any way that is going to require action will be six months down, and that is when the bank is not going to have their work. And then it's too late. But if someone has the confidence and the faith and the trust in the nonprofit to call, then I can say, okay, you know, come to the office in the evening or on the weekend, bring, you know, whatever paperwork we need, and let's sit down and talk about it. But today, I'll get on the basics, do some research, you go to work, you know, take care of the kids, what have you, and we will help you out. We have zero foreclosures in our community. And I can tell you, it is because of the stewardship. It is an ongoing relationship. So when you are in a community and you set the land aside for the benefit of the community and families move into those homes, that nonprofit relationship is really not just to steward the land and make sure that it's available or that the building looks fine, but really it's to continue that homeowner education and support because you need to call somebody. And that's part of what the nonprofit does. Thank you, Ms. Well,